Good afternoon and welcome everyone. My name is Tanner Larkin. I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service, majoring in international politics and a student in the Center for Jewish Civilization. I'm also the president of the Georgetown Israel Alliance, Georgetown's cultural and political Zionist student group. Today, I am delighted to welcome you to Is the Two-State Solution Still Possible? A conversation with C.P. Levney. This event will be kicking off GIA's first ever Israel Peace Week, which will feature a number of events focusing on Israeli culture and the steps Israel has taken and hopefully will continue to take in the pursuit of a more just society and a lasting peace with the Palestinians. I invite you to join us again on Tuesday for Nadav Tamir, an Israeli diplomat brought by J Street U Georgetown, uh, on Wednesday for Uri Kedar, an advocate for greater pluralism in Israel, and on Thursday for our celebration of Israel's 70th birthday on Kopli Lawn. Before we begin, I'd like to thank Itai Weiss, as well as Anna Dubinsky and the rest of the CJC, without whom this event would not be possible. I would also like to thank our co-sponsoring organizations, the CJC, J Street U Georgetown, the GU College Democrats, the International Relations Club, and the GU Institute of Politics and Public Service. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce Professor and Director of the Center for Jewish Civilization, Jacques Berlinerblau. All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, how are you? All right, welcome to the Hilltop. My name is Jacques Berlinerblau, and I'm the Director of the Center for Jewish Civilization. On behalf of our associate director, Dr. Anna Summer Schneider, our assistant director, Dr. Karen Hammerschlag, and the chair of our executive committee, Professor Bruce Hoffman, I want to welcome each and every one of you to what promises to be a landmark event in the ongoing uh, history of the Center for Jewish Civilization. Before we begin, however, I cannot properly express my gratitude and appreciation for the young people who actually put this event together and extended the initial invitation to our most distinguished guests today. I have been at Georgetown University now for a long time, 13 years, and this is by far the best work that the student-run Georgetown Israel Alliance has ever performed. This is a sign of things to come, ladies and gentlemen. I want to take a moment to thank these young people. They're really responsible for this event today. We're just helping them out with some logistics. Please join me in thanking uh, CJC and SFS sophomore Tanner Larkin. D hold your applause, please. Stand up, Tanner. And SFS sophomore and soon to be in the CJC, Ben Goodman. <laughs> Gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs> These are our kids in the School of Foreign Service, and we believe they are truly the leaders of tomorrow. Whatever answers we're going to find are going to come from them. Today we're proud to host a dialogue between two leading figures in the ongoing conversation about Israel, her future, and her neighbors and her citizens. I want to reiterate two things. The first is if you could kindly turn off your cell phones or just put them to buzz so that they don't ring. The second, of course, is that Georgetown University welcomes free and robust difference of opinion, but in accordance with university policies, no one is permitted to shout or prevent someone from speaking. Anyone who fails to do so will initially be warned, and if they do not comply, they will be immediately uh, removed. Change of our tone. It is our pleasure to bring to our campus <laughs> member of Knesset and former Minister of Justice of Israel, Tippi Livni, named one of Time Magazine's most influential people in the world. M.K. Livni was elected to Knesset in 1999. In 2006, she was appointed as Foreign Minister and later that year appointed as the Deputy Prime Minister. Between 2013 and 2014, M.K. Livni served as the Chief Negotiator for Israel during peace talks with the Palestinians organized by former U.S. Secretary of State John Kerry. Currently, M.K. Livni is the head of the Hatnua Party and a co-leader of the Zionist Union Party. She's a member of the Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee and is head of the Subcommittee for International Legal Warfare. Her interlocutor today will be Ambassador Dennis Ross. Ambassador Ross is a former special assistant to President Barack Obama and served in senior national security positions in the Reagan, George H.W. Bush, and Clinton administrations. He currently serves as counselor and as the William Davidson Distinguished Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. We are also pretty proud to say that he is a distinguished professor of the practice of diplomacy here at Georgetown University's Center for Jewish Civilization. So we're going to speak for about 50 minutes till about 4 o'clock, and then Ambassador Ross is going to moderate questions from you, the audience, until our hard stop at around 4.15, 4.20. We're so excited to have both of you. Ambassador Ross, the floor is yours. Welcome. 
Thank you. Thank you, Josh. I would like to apologize at first for being late. I uh, used uh, the GPS for a nice walk, and it turned to be quite a problematic walk in the sun. As an Israeli, to say that it was too hot for me, I'm quite ashamed to say, uh, and therefore I'm late. And don't use the GPS example later, because I'm going to use it as another example, so don't use this against me. OK. <laughs> we won't. And um, first, it's great that you're here. And I think everybody, the turnout is a reflection of how anxious I think people are to, to hear us talk about this issue. Uh, is the two-state outcome solution, is it still a, is something that can be achieved? Uh, for some of us, there is obviously a sense that there's no alternative to it. But we'll get into that. And one of the things I want to do, I've known you a long time, uh, but I want people here also to understand your personal evolution. Uh, the first time you and I met was uh, at Ben Gurion University uh, in March of 2001. I had just left having been the American negotiator, having been the prime author, principal author of the Clinton Parameters. Okay. Uh, and, and you were uh, a member of Knesset from Likud. And at that time, you were actually able to restrain your enthusiasm for the Clinton Parameters. Your views were somewhat different then, uh, but clearly you have evolved. And I'd like, I would like this audience to hear a little bit about your own personal evolution and how you've come to adopt the views that you have, because you clearly are seen as a leader of the peace camp within Israel now. OK, uh, thank you. I will uh, go back to the Clinton parameters later. Uh, basically, I was born to a family. Both my parents were. Uh, uh, in the underground, fighting for the establishment of the State of Israel. Uh, both of them got married the same day the State of Israel was established. And they believe in the rights of the Jewish people on the entire land, both sides of Jordan River, not just the tiny place between uh, Jordan River and Mediterranean Sea. And uh, so they believe in what we call also today great, the part of the camp of greater Israel. But on the other side, the values that I was uh, educated upon were about equal rights. So the whole idea was having a Jewish and democratic state, a nation state of the Jewish people with equal rights to all its citizens. So before I joined politics, I felt that we are in an ongoing conflict without a real understanding what will come next. And uh, we cannot annex the territories without giving equal rights to the Palestinians. There is no option for me to live in an apartheid state. And therefore, we need, in order to have the vision of Jewish democratic secured state in the ancient land of Israel, we need to give up part of the land. Because otherwise, Israel would not be uh, a Jewish state without a Jewish majority. So in 1995, a few weeks before Prime Minister Rabin was assassinated, I decided to join politics. And what I said was the following. Yes, I believe in the rights of the Jewish people on the entire land. Yes, I understand that we need to divide the land. But I read the Oslo Accord, Oslo Agreement. And I, I'm a lawyer. Uh, and I said, OK, this is not a real uh, agreement. This is more a memorandum of understanding. It postponed all the core issues to the end. It just, you know, some ideas. And I said, uh, you know, as, as a lawyer, I wouldn't have given the client of mine the possibility to sell his second-hand apartment and to give the keys without getting the full consideration. So I said, OK, I need to join politics in order to reach a final status agreement relating to all the core issues and of conflict. And this is my uh, role in life. It was in 1995. And I was interviewed on my first interview on Israeli television. I was asked about the Oslo Agreement. And yeah. I said, listen, I think that uh, it's, it, it was not done in a manner that uh, I think it's, it's the best. But Israel is a democracy. And therefore, we need to accept it. And uh, the whole idea is to improve it later. So I was not against the idea of dividing the land. I was not against for building more settlements. It was more about how to reach a better agreement. Mm -hmm. 
And then in 2000, I read the Clinton parameters. I don't remember this meeting, but I'm sure that if we discuss the parameters, I related to one issue there. And I this was the issue, yes. <laughs> <laughs> For a while, I was one track mind. Yeah. And this, it was about the refugees, I and I, I'll try to explain this uh, uh, to them. My understanding of ending the conflict is not just two states. The whole idea is not just to create another state in the Middle East. The whole idea is to end the conflict on the basis of two states for two peoples, that each state gives an answer to national aspiration of different peoples, Israel to the Jewish people, and the Palestinian state should right. be the full, complete answer to the aspiration of the Palestinians, wherever they may be, those who live in the territories and those who live in refugee camps with uh, uh, keys on their necks, waiting these keys to open doors in Israel which is going to be the answer for the Jewish people. And in Clinton parameters, I asked, by the way, later I asked Bill Clinton about it. Yeah. It was written that the refugees, they left Israel when the state of Israel was established. They are not connected to the 67 war. And the whole idea, and, and in the parameters, it was that they can choose one of five options. That's right. The Palestinian state, the swap territories, right. uh, host, uh, the countries, the hosted They're countries, in. new countries like Canada, third countries, third countries, and Israel that can, that is sovereign to define or to de decide how many would enter Israel. It's an Israeli choice. An Israeli decision. It's an Israeli decision. Right. Israel is sovereign to decide. Right, that's right. This was the, I think, right, the, the, right. the wording. And I said, how come? If the whole idea is ending the conflict, two states for two peoples, I don't want these refugees to knock on our doors. And this is like an American movie, not the best one, when you see somebody blonde, nice, and somebody's knocking at the door, and she opens with the chain, and we know that somebody is going to kick the door. So I said, when we open this with the chain, Israel can never say why we say yes to Ahmed, that his grandfather house is in Jaffa, and no to uh, another Palestinian. And this is going to be a humanitarian issue that is going to undermine the legitimacy of the state of Israel that was created in 1948 uh, when those people left. And the, the Palestinian refugees are the only refugees in the world that you can inherit this status. It's four and five generations that you're in. Since Second World War, all the refugees' problem was, was solved. So this was my only, uh, it was not against the concept. It was against this uh, uh, article. It's, it's an interesting point, because that the, the Clinton parameters grew out of um, I won't do the whole story, but they grew out of a request from both sides coming to us and saying, we can't bridge our differences. At the very end of the administration, we brought them together at Bowling Air Force Base based upon a set of understandings. They were trying to bridge the differences. After three and a half days, they came to me and they said, we can't do it. We need you to create a bridging proposal. So the Clinton parameters were a bridging proposal. And it was a good idea. Uh, and the, you know, I still think it's yeah. still is a good idea. Uh, so it was a bridging proposal, and it also was not an American policy position. As the president, when he presented the parameters, what he said is, these are our ideas to bridge the gap between the two sides. They leave, if they're not accepted, they leave with me when I leave office. So they weren't actually a formal American position. Interesting enough, it was George W. Bush who was the first president to actually adopt the idea of two states. We didn't do it. Yeah. It was implicit in the Clinton administration, but it wasn't formal policy. So, and then, and then, when Bush was elected, I convinced Arik Sharon, the Israel Prime Minister, to give me the possibility to go to the States. And I convinced Condi Rice that uh, President Bush uh, ideas based on two states for two peoples means also that the creation of the Palestinian state is the answer to the Palestinian refugees. And President Bush gave it as a letter to Arik Sharon uh, as, as, as part of the concept. He does this on uh, April 
14, 2004. The first few years yes. of the Bush administration, yes. they were in what is now a tradition, whatever your predecessor did, you'll have nothing to do with. So <laughs> yeah. it was at that time, it was anything but Clinton. So they wouldn't touch the idea of a peace process. So it but means that Trump would adopt this idea in three years from now? <laughs> uh, uh, we can hope. Uh, so let's, I, let's, let's take this uh, a little further. So you have been, I mean, you just outlined something I think very important about your own views, that what guided you coming from what was the revisionist tradition and actually consistent with Jabotinsky yes. and Begin was a real belief in uh, the rights of the individual, that the rights of the individual had to be respected. But when you look at, I'm not labeling individuals, but when you look at many in the Likud party today, uh, certainly I would, and I would certainly say in Jewish home today, who might see themselves as being the representatives of what was the, Well, they are not. So, so how do you, what, what's changed there in terms of the historic, those on the right side of the political spectrum in Israel? You know, I wrote, I asked by a right-wing newspaper a few days ago, Makorishon, to write an open letter to Jabotinsky. And I think that Jabotinsky's choice was one of two. One, or to annex the entire territories and to give equal rights to all those living there. You know, you are talking about individuals. What he said is every individual is a king. The, it was not about the state. It was about the people. It's about human beings, about those, the citizens. It was not about this, the, the future Jewish state. Uh, this is one option. And the other is to divide the land. He was talking about the rights of minorities right. and everything. Right. Now, the Likud party is focused now on... Uh, you know, it's a world of images and perception and, uh, you know, being strong. We have the rights on the entire land. Uh, and in a way, they make um, a mix between this ideological vision about the land and Israel's security. And this is something that I'm trying to work against in Israel because settlements are part of this vision of greater Israel. The whole idea in 1967, I was I'm too old to remember this, unfortunately. The whole idea was that, oh, wow, we came back to the place of our forefathers, these holy places, it's ours, and let's send people to live there, and we can live happily ever after in this place. This was the whole idea. And Menachem Begin thought about giving equal rights to, to the Palestinians, to the Arabs, to the Muslims who lived there. Those days, they were not talking in terms of uh, peoples, the Palestinians. And so settlements are part of this vision. Settlements are, are not part of Israel's security concept. Israel's security is based on our army, our soldiers. It's not about sending a family with children to live up in a hill uh, to do what? It's part of a completely different vision. And what's happening now is that it's a mix because we have terror and we have security problems. So the idea of giving the territory to the Palestinians is being perceived as being too weak, uh, giving the Palestinians, thinking about the enemy. Uh, when I preach for, preach for two states for two peoples, I'm thinking about Israel as a Jewish democratic state, but I'm being blamed that I'm thinking about the Palestinians, that I want to give them. And my answer is that I want to have a border as a state. I want to, in a way, to divorce the Palestinians, not to get married with them. It's, it's this world of images and populism, and uh, it's not only in Israel. We see this it's trend true. of populistic. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm raising the question because, you know, you, you have other people um, like President Rivlin. You have people like Misha Ahrens who still reflect that yes. tradition of recognizing the rights. The, they, may, as I said, Jabotinsky put, in a way, those supporting or adapting uh, Jabotinsky's ideology can choose between one state and equal rights to all. This is right. Ruby Rivlin, President Rivlin's support, and others from the old guard of, of uh, Likud or to divide the land. And this is something that us, not only me, me and other uh, 
sons of uh, those that are member of, of the army, like Dan Meridor, like others, right. politicians that right. understand that we cannot have both. It's a tough decision, but this is the only decision because otherwise we are going to, um, in a slippery slope toward whether an apartheid state or an Arab state or a binational state with an ongoing conflict. So let's look at this from the standpoint of in effect, a set of choices. One choice is you negotiate a two-state outcome. Now that assumes that being able to negotiate a two-state outcome is something that's available in the near term. You wrote at one point uh, about March 17, 2014, when Abu Mazen was presented by President Obama, uh, a set of principles that actually went beyond what had been worked out with the government you were a part of at that time. Meaning something very forward-leaning was presented to Abu Mazen on all the core issues of the conflict, and he never responded. Yeah. Um, when you, A, I'll ask you this in two parts. A, was that a missed opportunity from your standpoint? And B, what does it say about the ability to negotiate a two-state outcome now? Okay, this is really uh, a point. Uh, I was award a few days after this meeting and that we tried to relaunch the negotiations and uh, we discovered what happened in that meeting and later uh, my, well, you know him, uh, Dr. Tal Becker. Yeah. Uh, we sat with the Palestinians in the meeting and uh, my advisor uh, very close advisor said, and he used my yellow block and he wrote tragedy. This is what we had in 2014. We worked with the US in order to form a uh, framework for negotiations, giving an answer to all the core issues. And more than that, in order to give space to the leaders, the whole idea was to put an American paper and to give both sides the possibility to say yes, but. Yes, we are willing to negotiate on the basis of this, but we have reservations and we will raise these reser reservations during the negotiations. And Netanyahu was willing to do so, even though he was not familiar with some, I think one article was changed, but basically to most of it. Yeah. And uh, Abu Mazen was invited to the White House on March 17. It's a cursed day. Next year we had elections in Israel and Netanyahu won. <laughs> the same day. Anyway, uh, Abu Mazen had this meeting in uh, uh, the White House, and he didn't give an answer. Right. And I, I met him later, uh, trying to understand what happened. And I got all the reasons slash excuses from Abu Mazen, Saibarikat, and uh, all, all the others that were part of these different excuses, different reasons. And uh, for me, this was a moment to, to, to decide or to understand, uh, do we have a partner on the other side who is willing also to take bold decisions? And any agreement is based on uh, compromises by both sides. And I believe that the leaders who would make the agreement are those understanding that the price of not having an agreement is higher than the price of signing an agreement. The problem is that the price of not having an agreement is at the price that the people pay. And the political price is the price that they pay here and now. <laughs> uh, I can share with you what the answers that I got but then I reached to a completely different uh, understanding. And it's not about the other side, it's about us. And if I may, I would use the GPS example now. Okay. <laughs> We've been waiting for it, so it's good. <clears throat> Instead of focusing whether we have a partner or not, and to reach an agreement, we need a partner. My problem now in Israel is that we are not going to the same direction. And I'm not talking about Israel and the Palestinians, I'm talking about different parts of Israel politics. My GPS is 
it's not two states for two peoples. My GPS is a Jewish democratic state. On the way, I need to stop in the station and to reach an agreement with the Palestinians. Because in order to have Israel as a Jewish democratic state, I need a Jewish majority. I cannot keep the entire land, so I need to separate ourselves from the Palestinians, hopefully to reach an agreement with. Now we have a problem. Abu Mazen was not willing to say yes, that is needed in order to sign an agreement. GPS ways, so we have traffic jams. And now I need to decide what I do, whether waiting for a while until we will find somebody to sign an agreement with, or try and find other roads toward the same direction. As long as we are not turning you know, to a completely different road. And the different road, the different GPS is Greater Israel. And the stop for those taking us to Greater Israel is uh, erosion on uh, Israel's uh, democratic values. And more settlements are the bumpers on our road. And therefore, even if there are problems on the other side, my personal decision is instead of focusing, asking myself whether there is a partner on the other side, to keep moving and to find a way to continue without them. If we decide that we want to divide the land and we know that we want the blocks of settlements as part of Israel and we build the security fence, we can um, finish uh, and to build the security fence. I would not build new settlements or uh, expand settlements that are outside of, of, of the fence, of the blocks. Um, all these things that do not serve or are not coherent with, with the way, with the vision, with the GPS, with the national GPS, I would not do. And I try to avoid obstacles on the road. And hopefully, in the end, one or two things would happen. Or we would find a partner to reach an agreement with. Or uh, we would keep Israel security uh, and call the settlers that are living outside of uh, the fence to, to, to come to Israel and to focus on the vision of Zionism the way I understand it. I think it's, I'm going to get into this a little bit more, but I want to. I want to provide a little bit more context for all of you as well. Just looking at the demographics now, sometimes the demographics are misportrayed in terms of uh, the Arabs are going to be a majority very quickly. It's not true. But today, not counting Gaza, and I don't count Gaza because Israel got out, you have 6.3 million Jews who live in Israel in the West Bank. You have 4.3 million Arabs who live in Israel in the West Bank. So you're already at 60-40. The kind of state that was envisioned as Israel, the Jewish democratic state, was not a state where there was this very large Arab minority. Now, the truth is the demographic trends are such that it might take 25 years to reach parity. Again, not counting Gaza. But still, so let's say in five years, it's, a, it's already 57-43. You're changing the character of the state. Now, what Sipi is raising is, how do you preserve the character of the state given what is this reality? This isn't an argument. And this is a, you know, and we don't deal in, all, we're at the university, so we don't deal in alternative facts. <laughs> Nor do we deal in alternative reality. We deal in facts. So these are the facts, and this is what Israel has to contend with. Now, one other, I would say, reality we know both from the, two, the 2014 example, and I would even say also the 2008 example, that it's, it's not, it wasn't easy for Abu Mazen, and we can get into our theories as to why, to make the decision to reach an agreement. I often used to say, I came to the conclusion that Arif had had the capability but not the intention to do two states for two peoples, Abu Mazen had the intention, but not the capability to do the two states for two peoples. What Sipi is raising is, even if that's not possible in the near term, and this is the title of this discussion, it's very important to keep it alive as an option. Not as a favor to the Palestinians, but because Israel needs it. Yeah. So, the, so the challenge becomes how to keep it alive. And as you yourself said, it's not a simple thing politically to keep it alive. And this is actually the real question I want to ask you. 
why doesn't this issue of preserving Israel as a Jewish democratic state, uh, why doesn't it have more political resonance right now in Israel? There's, there doesn't seem to be much of a debate on it. When there's polling done, it shows the overwhelming majority of Israelis will say, absolutely. You know, and they even say, we'd like to separate from the Palestinians. And yet, politically, it doesn't seem to translate. It doesn't seem to trigger a debate. Why is that? Because of several reasons. One is that what we did in the past toward this, and right wing in Israel attacked severely, now they are using it. For example, what you said about demographic. Can you yeah. say, okay, okay, excluding Gaza. When we left Gaza Strip, we were under attack coming from right wing. Right. Okay? But nobody now suggests to reconquer and reoccupy Gaza Strip with these two million of Palestinians living there. So in a way, when we left Gaza, we reduced the, ten the demographic tension, one thing. Secondly, Oslo Agreement. I heard the Israelis saying to me, what do you want? They have this kind of a state, the Palestinian Authority. So they are completely against the Oslo Agreement. They call those that uh, signed the Oslo Agreement the Oslo criminals. But yet, Jewish Omnam, they are saying, what do you want? They have the authority. They can vote to the Palestinian Authority. So they, are, they base their uh, um, understanding and explanation to the people on things that we, well, my camp, in a way, did in the past, and they yeah. were completely against it. This is one thing. Secondly, and this is my frustration, you have vast majority of Israeli or Jews who wants to keep Israel. This is the most important thing for them, to keep Israel as a Jewish state, as a nation state of a Jewish people, to have a Jewish majority. Netanyahu won last election by saying that the Arabs are coming to the yeah. polls. And we have now an internal discussion on 20,000 uh, um, uh, immigrants, right. uh, those who infiltrated into Israel. And the reason that people are trying to change the law and acting against the Supreme Court, because this is change, they, they are not Jews. And I said, that how can you be against 20,000 and absorb millions of Palestinians? So it's not coherent. It's not that people, the people they want it, they feel that this is the most important thing. They are so proud of Israel, and rightly so, to be a Jewish democratic state. But it's not, it's not here and now, as, as the solution is not feasible and the threat is not feasible. So it's and too more much than of an that, abstraction. And, and yes, and more than that, and another thing that we built was the, the security fence that basically divides Israel and the West Bank. So most of the Israelis are love, not living there. It's, it's, they don't see, the, the, it's something that look quite theoretical. And therefore, when we ask them in polls, do you support two states for two peoples, basically 67 line, they would say yes. Yeah. But there is no partner on the other side. And there is their terror. And we cannot trust the Palestinians. And uh, we can manage the conflict and continue like this. And that the threat and, and the opportunity are not uh, feasible. And the only way to make it more uh, feasible is to add, and this is something I don't need to tell you this, is to add another component, and this is the Arab world. Because the Israelis love to make peace with the Arabs. I'm talking about Gulf states, I'm talking about Sunni Arab states, I'm talking about those that we don't have direct conflict with. Now, since for the Arabs it's very important to have peace between Israel and the Palestinians, and they already promised and say, according to the Arab Peace Initiative, that they would uh, make peace with Israel uh, when uh, we finish the conflict with the Palestinians, this can be a huge opportunity that can make it more tangible to Israelis, it changes Israel's security. It's, it's something, it's not, you know, the same old Abu Mazen and this, the, 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 this tiny place and having terror and it's very close. It's, it's a tiny place, really. 
And we have the example of Gaza Strip. We left and we got terror in return. And we are not there. And yet the international community blame us for ev everything that's happening there. So I can understand why this is happening, but it makes my job harder. Right. So I want to I want to ask you in a second what how you contend with that. But let me let's let's focus on the Arabs for a minute before we go to that. This notion of outside in. This is this concept that the Arabs can kind of play a role for the Palestinians. It's a <coughs> it's 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 very attractive, but it's not quite real because the Arabs won't substitute for the Palestinians, but they could provide a cover for the Palestinians. One of the things to understand on the Palestinian side, it's very hard to rationalize compromise because first they see themselves uh, as the weakest party. Second, they're divided. Third, they have this deep-seated sense of injustice and grievance, and they see Israel as strong, so that the onus should be on Israel, or the onus should be on the US, or the onus should be on the Arabs, but it's really not on them. And because it's very difficult for them to contemplate a compromise and rationalize it, there is an Arab role here. Because the Arabs, if they come in, they can create an umbrella. And they can share, in a sense, the responsibility. Not be a substitute for it, but they can share the responsibility, create a cover for the Palestinians, but also, as Sipi was just saying, cover for Israel. Because it's hard for Israelis to rationalize compromises or concessions to the Palestinians because they're convinced they don't get anything for it. Exactly. But if they get something from the Arabs, then they can rationalize it. So it makes sense at a theoretical level. Now, the rub is how we, ch how we translate the theory into practice. And here, there, are, there is, look, there is a new reality in the Middle East. The Sunni Arab leadership sees Israel uh, as a bulwark against the Iranians. They see a common strategic threat, and ironically, uh, the more they questioned President Obama, the more they began to look at Israel as being not an alternative, but they looked at the U.S. always as being the guarantor of their security. And with the image that the U.S. was withdrawing from the region, which, by the way, the Trump administration has not changed. It hasn't. And when the president a little over a week ago said, we're getting out of No, no, Obama Syria, left the region, and uh, Trump is not re-entering. That's right. So... The Arab, the key Arab states, OK, I got it. The key Arab states, <laughs> I get signals at the same time. That it, oh. And I respect the signals. I want you to know that. Uh, they, for, the, for the key Arab states, there is uh, a desire to have someone to be the guarantor of their security. Now, they looked around, and they said, well, it can't be the Russians, because they're actually creating the problem. Yeah. It can't be the Chinese, because they're basically mercantilists, and they don't do this can't be the Europeans because the Europeans, well, this is really, they're mostly from Venus, not from Mars, so they won't do it. <laughs> so they looked and they saw Israel. And they said, you know, the one thing about the Israelis, they may not talk about it, but they do it. So there's a, there's a sense that Israel will act. But here's where the Palestinians come back into focus. Because in the open, they can't look like they're working with the Israelis without, without having the Palestinian issue dealt with either resolved or dealt with in a credible way. And so there's a, there's a tension here. And even though Mohammed bin Salman, who's carrying out a revolution from above within Saudi Arabia, made a very interesting uh, statement here, an answer to a question from Jeffrey Goldberg. Goldberg asked him the question, do, do the Jewish people have a right to at least a part of their ancestral homeland? And his answer was first to refer to them as a people and then as a nation, and then to say, uh, the Israelis and the Palestinians had a right to their homelands. Now, that crossed a historic threshold because the Arabs have had a tendency to accept the fact of Israel, the reality of Israel, but not necessarily the right of Israel to be there. Now, when you accept it as a fact, you know, terror against it would still be a fact. It's not really illegitimate. If you think that Israel, in fact, has the right to be there, it changes the way you interact with Israel. So this is an important statement, but the question that remains unanswered, and we really won't know it until the Trump administration presents its plan, and a lot depends about how they do it, and we can get into that as well. Will Arab leaders be prepared to embrace a peace plan in a way that actually 
doesn't let the Palestinians determine whether it's acceptable or not. The rule of thumb up until now has been we'll support whatever the Palestinians embrace. But if the Palestinians can't or won't embrace it, does that inherently create a veto on the Arabs? Up until now, that's been the case. The question now is, is it potentially different? Do you perceive it to be different? You know, in 2007 or eight, I met right. the representatives of, of the Arab League and uh, I asked them about the negotiations and I asked them about the Arab Peace Initiative and they said, is it negotiable or uh, you know, take it or leave it? And they said, right. no, it's negotiable. I say, great, okay, can we negotiate this? <laughs> and they say, no, <laughs> you, can have, you can have the phone number of the Palestinians, you should negotiate with them and we will support any, any uh, decision of the Palestinians, like right. the, uh, what you said. Uh, I think that what is changing now is, and for many years the Palestinians knew that the Arabs would do whatever they asked them to do. Mm -hmm. And I think that the changes are now basically in the Saudis. I mean, the uh, UAE were always uh, more forthcoming. Right. And uh, everything is changing in Saudi. It's not only about Israel. That's right. Uh, young people, uh, new ideas, and uh, I think that for the first time, uh, and, and Iran is their threat, not Israel, they need the U.S., and I think that this depends on, so also on Trump, because for now, those who celebrated when Trump was elected were <laughs> part of part of Israel <laughs> and uh, some Gulf states thinking that now everything is going to change, especially when it comes to Iran. So as long as this is uh, in the air, I think that they are willing to, to, to take certain steps if Trump would convince them that this is what is needed. But I don't think that on the most sensitive issues, like Jerusalem, like refugees, they will take steps that are completely ignoring uh, right. the connection or, or the rights. So I'm sure that, okay, I'll say, if we would put again the 2014 paper on the table, they can accept it yeah. and convince Abu Mazen to move forward on the basis of this. But I don't think that this is, this is the paper that the current administration is preparing. Well, we don't know yet. I, I would say this. By the, the, the decision on Jerusalem, uh, in a sense, requires something more ambitious on Jerusalem in their plan. It might have actually worked without the decision, without declaring Jerusalem as the capital and moving the embassy, if A, the ground had either been prepared for that. I mean, if you're going to depend upon the Arabs, then you need to go to them in advance and say, we're going to make this decision. We don't want to put you in the corner. We don't want to deny your political space. Let's talk together about how we can publicly frame it and condition the environment so everyone gets used to it. Having not done that, uh, to simply say two capitals for two states in Jerusalem is not enough now. Now I'm afraid that the plan, whenever it's presented, is going to have to be, it's going to have to be more definitive in terms of uh, what the Palestinians would be getting in East Jerusalem. Now, whether the administration is prepared to cross that threshold, I don't know. Uh, I do think you're right. For the Saudis in particular, they're going to have to be able to point to Jerusalem having been addressed in a credible way. I think the challenge for the administration, and one of the things that Jared Kushner and Jason Greenblatt said a little over a month ago when they went to the Security Council, they were in a, in a briefing of the Security Council. It wasn't a public briefing, but what came out was they said the Israelis and the Arabs will love some of what we present and they'll hate some of what we present. The key is going to be, is there enough, at least for the Arab enough leaders... love for both sides yeah. to say yes. <laughs> well, it has to, yeah. It can't be one side loves this much and the other side loves this much because it won't work that way. I, I completely agree. I, I'm not sure whether their assessment about... I would say the following. If the love and hate... Of, on the, of the, the Israeli side is in accordance to the platform of 
uh, the representative of far right in the Israeli government, so it's not going to be a deal. So let's, well, we don't know yet, so we'll have to wait and see. I, I know we have, we're going to turn to questions to you. I want to ask one last one before uh, I turn it over to, you, to the audience. Uh, you've outlined what the problems are. What's your current strategy for how to try to affect uh, the public in Israel so that this default path that we're on, because that's what we're on, we're on a path that leads towards a binational state unless something is done differently. So what, what are you trying to do? What do you hope to be able to do? Uh, firstly, it depends on what would be also with the Trump plan. Uh -huh. If this is, if something is on the table, it is changing everything. For better or for worse, I don't yeah. know. Uh, it can be the reason or the excuse to say that there is no partner on the other side and let's annex the territories. Or, oh, wow, there is hope and something is happening. But even while negotiating, there was no trust on both sides, on Israel and the Palestinians, that something would get out of it. Um, I am more focused now on saying, as I said before, let's decide what we want. As when the State of Israel was established, the Arab didn't accept the United Nations resolution. We mm -hmm. built our state. Mm -hmm. So let's do what is best for us. It's not about finding a Palestinian who would negotiate this for us and make a difference between Israel's security and, and uh, settlements activity. Because now it's, it's, mm -hmm. it's a mix. And talking about security, the meaning is that until we reach an agreement or we, we face a situation in which somebody is taking the control, we will not take unilateral steps that would expose Israel uh, to security threats. Uh -huh. uh, we need to give an answer to Israel's security because mostly uh, the Israelis support the idea of two states for two peoples, but they are not willing to take, and I can understand it. The you security look at what's happening risk. in the region, you understand the nature of the threat. Is it, do you think, and this is the last question, do you think that the, um, the basic instincts of the public are with where you want to be, but somehow something has to happen to sort of move them. And I'll give you an example of what could happen as a kind of wake-up call. We're seeing for the first time, and you know you're aware that Palestinians in uh, East Jerusalem always had the right to vote in the municipal elections, but didn't because yeah. the PLO used to say that if you do that, you're betraying the, the national cause. Now there's a movement among them to actually vote. Uh, is that potentially one of the things that could be a wake-up call? Yes. Uh, but I learned, uh, and, and people's mind on these Arab villages, Palestinian villages, yeah. that are part of the uh, municipality of Jerusalem changed during these years. Since the Clinton parameters, we are in completely different a place because uh, the Israelis understand that we have uh, more than 200,000 uh, Palestinians. Right. And uh, we are not connected uh, religiously, historically, emotionally to these places. We don't even visit. It's, it's completely uh, a different place. But you know what I learned from uh, history? And I'm trying Hopefully, it's not, I'm not saying something also about myself. When things are happening, both sides of the political map take it as an example why they're right. <laughs> so when we had the changes in the Arab world, I said, OK, it's an opportunity. Let's do something. And the others would say, why to do something? Let's wait. They will make peace with us without having peace with the Palestinians. Uh, when we had the Arab, what was called the Arab Spring, that turned into an Islamic uh, winter, I said, OK, let's not stop. Let's grab something and move forward. And said, no, let's wait and see what's happening. When you have terror, some would say, OK, why to live with all these terror attacks? Let's separate ourselves from the Palestinians, make peace. Right. And the others say, to give them the territory now and to expose ourselves to more terror. It's, but I agree that 
to change people's mind, sometimes something that you know rocks the boat is is, yeah. is the thing that change people's mind. But from um, past uh, years uh, history, mostly the the Israeli public opinion is on these issues. It's there is a vast majority that supports the idea, but people are not talking about it. And in the end, in election, left, center left, center right, it's 50-50. Right. It's 50-50. Right, that's I think something that is not as well understood as it might be. The, the number of mandates that have to change is really pretty small when you and look at the actual numbers. In the last election, Netanyahu didn't, took, didn't take one vote, one voter, from our camp. Right. He swallowed uh, the far right voters. Right. So basically it's 50-50. It's a matter of the nature of coalitions in Israel and uh, Netanyahu is the prime minister, he's very strong, but he has 20 something percent support, that's it. Okay, we obviously could go on for a long time, but we're gonna turn it over to you. So let's take questions from, uh, from the audience. We're going to start there. Would you stand up and just, yeah. Yep. Um, I'm Sam Kramer. I'm a first year here at Georgetown, uh, member of Nassim Lebani. Thank you so much for coming here and speaking to us. And I'd like to ask your opinion regarding the uh, future of Israeli politics. A lot of people have said that the center left, you know, the Labor Party and uh, Meretz, they are heading out of political relevance and that people like Yair Lapid who are more toward the middle are going to be taking up the uh, sort of political thunder. As someone who has been on the right, the center, and now the center left, what, what do you think? Do you think that the political tides are shifting again? <clears throat> I think that, uh, uh, to answer each question? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What I tried to say before is that basically I joined politics believing on, in the same concept that I share with you now. I learned during the years uh, since our first meeting, and I learned about realities, but the concept, the ideology didn't change. Um, I believe that we should put our agenda, our vision, our story, our narrative on the table, and to say this is what the government represents. They are taking us to greater Israel, less democracy, more land, ongoing conflict. This is clear now. Now let's put on the table something that we believe in and stick together and have political agreements whether to join forces, to run together in one list to the parliament, or even to run in different parties and to say that the one of us who is going to get the more votes amongst us is the one that we would recommend for the president that he will be, he or she will be the next prime minister. So the whole idea is to work together and not to try and change what we believe in because we feel that the public opinion is in a different place. And part of my criticism on some of uh, my friends in what we call the block or the camp is that they are trying to, to speak to the voters in right wing. And in a way, we are serving the interest and uh, the narrative of right wing. And they don't need us to vote for what they believe in. <laughs> And this is what I believe in, uh, to join forces, to teach to our narrative, to put it on, to fight for it. And now it's very clear because I think that it's for the first time since many years that you have a very clear face in a way of a government without any center or left wing uh, party within this government. So it's very clear to say two roads, two GPS, two different directions, let's choose. Okay. Let's over here. Okay, hello. So I'll introduce myself first. Um, my name is Tom Ashkenazi. I'm a junior here at the Georgetown School of Foreign Service. 
I was born in Israel, but lived for a long part of my life in California. Um, so my question for you, um, Knesset member Livni, um, so my family has been, we've been big supporters of the peace camp in Israel, we've voted Labor, we've voted Kadima, but I must say um, the Zionist Union, right, our bloc, has failed us. Um, it's been headed pe by people like Herzog and Gabay that have not been very charismatic and have tried to appeal to more right-wing, more traditional voters. Um, now, I mean, you can't blame them. I think Israelis are not really interested in hearing about land for peace. But then again, if people like Avi Gabay, who said things like the left has forgotten what it is to be Jewish, he, said, he backtracked and said, oh, maybe we won't need to evacuate settlements in an agreement. When Avi Gabay says things like this and tries to position himself um, more right, like more right wing than what's been Zionist Union stance, what will distinguish the Zionist Union from other centrist Israeli parties like Kulano, like Geshatid? So that's basically my question. Where, where are we headed? Is there any chance um, for me to see a center left Israeli prime minister in my lifetime? In your lifetime, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. The same answer. What is the difference? We have a vision, and I believe that we should put it on the table. We shouldn't speak like uh, imitating uh, Netanyahu or speaking to his voters. Uh, the reason for me to be in politics, I just explained this, is because I believe in something, not because I want to be there and not because I want to be the prime minister. To be the prime minister, to do something that I believe in. And therefore, I believe that it's time for us to fight for our beliefs. And I criticized publicly when Gabay said that, that there's a possibility to make an agreement with, while keeping all the settlements in place. I said, I said publicly that it's, it's, it's not possible. And uh, um, as I said before, I, unfortunately, not all the leaders in, in this camp are doing it, and not all the voters. And this is something that makes me angry also. You are angry, uh, your family is angry as voters. Now I want to sp say something about the voters. <laughs> because uh, Netanyahu won the last elections because he called the camp and he said, I'm the leader, you should support me because otherwise we are going to lose. And they, they, the, the story, I don't know whether it's true or, or, or not that the father of Naftali Bennett called him after the, the election, asked him whether the block uh, won, not how much seats his son got in the parliament, but what about the bloc, but the Netanyahu won. And our voters, something like you said, okay, this leader is not charismatic enough. The other, the third in the list of labor is too socialist for us. Come on, we have these huge decisions, bold decisions to make, so, not only could voters are happy with the list and all the members of uh, uh, parliament uh, uh, of Likud, but they're willing to vote for it because they believe in something. A short story. In 1999, I was in, in Likud. And it was after Netanyahu was uh, his, in his first term as a prime minister. And he was not liked by vast majority of Israelis. It, it was quite, it was not a very, we were not very proud of being in Likud when he was the, the leader. You know what was the sticker that we put you know, in the, on the car? We are proud Likudniks. Why? Because, because this is the camp, this is our party, this is what we believe in, and you can do whatever you want. And you don't, you don't have this kind of feeling, you know, fighting center left. It is more about maybe we are wrong, maybe they are right, maybe we are not okay. Come on, we have to fight for something. And I feel like we are in Israel, you know. Ambassador Ross, uh, <laughs> Mr. Perfect. Livni, my name is Mohammed Suleiman. I'm first year with the Master of Foreign Service. Uh, you talked about your own vision for um, a peace process, um, and the Trump administration more likely will have a proposal soon. Um, how do you envision uh, the settlements in the West Bank? 42% of the legal jurisdiction of the West Bank 
uh, from a structure perspective, engineering perspective, you might not really have a Palestinian state uh, in the West Bank. Uh, what do you think about that? What do you propose for this? Uh, most of the West Bank is going to be part of the Palestinian state, which is going to be demilitarized according to an agreement that we already reached with the Palestinians. Uh, when our security needs are going to be taken care of. Uh, and uh, what is called blocks of settlements are going to be part of Israel, but the good news is that it takes only a few percentage of the West Bank. Uh, and this is, the, this is basically the idea. This is what was written in uh, 2014. And uh, I can tell you that Netanyahu was willing given to discuss uh, or to, to enter into negotiation based on American papers saying that the the reference is going to be 67 line, but it should be clear that we cannot rewind the clock. We cannot turn history or to, to, to be, to, to delineate, you know, to, to, to put again the line of 67, because reality has changed. And therefore, we need to give an answer to realities on the ground, which are basically the blo what we call blocks of settlements. And these are the, the places that vast majority of Israelis are living there, uh, and they, as I said, takes only a few percentage. You can look at the line of defense now. This is basically what we are talking about. You know, the interesting thing is there are 130 settlements overall in the West Bank. Five represent 45% of the settler population. The concept of settlement blocks and swaps is something we came up with actually in the spring of 2000 before we went to Camp David. Yeah. And the whole idea was how do we capture the vast majority of the settlers uh, in, in a border? Uh, and this is the concept of, okay, you have blocks, and they could be, could be like 5% of the West Bank, but you get 80% of all the settlers. Not of the settlements, but 80% of all the settlers. Yeah. So this was a way to come up with a border, and the concept of swap or compensation was, OK, blocks for swaps. Be because evacuating people, I did it in, in Gaza, it's a very dramatic, painful uh, decision. Maybe the most difficult decision that I made, I think it was the right decision to do. And therefore, you cannot expect from any Israeli leader to, 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 to go back to the exact line of 67. And the Palestinians know, knows it as well, and the Arabs know it as well. So basically, we are on the same page on this. Um, over there. Uh, hello, my name is Sean Lerner. I'm a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service studying international politics. Um, my question is about the two-state solution specifically. Uh, there seems to be a fundamental divide between American supporters of the two-state solution, uh, especially those associated with groups like J Street and Israeli supporters of the two-state solution. The American supporters' support for the two-state solution, their rationale more comes from, a, I guess, how you would describe it, like marriage with the Palestinians. They see it as a solution that gives Palestinians a sense of justice and end to the occupation, things like this. A, a lot of the focus is on ending the occupation, whereas the Israeli viewpoint of support of the two-state two solution more so comes from a need for security, uh, separation from the Palestinians, so as not to have a problem with the Palestinians any longer. Why do you think this divide exists, and do you think there's a misunderstanding on one side or the other? Um, frankly, firstly, as, as I mentioned before, it's not only two states, it's two nation states or two states for two peoples. It's very important because this is the only way to end the conflict. Two states for two peoples, not just two states. Secondly, um, you know, it's funny. It's a kind of an absurd, because real left wing, those that are thinking about the Palestinians as individuals, would have supported in the idea of one state with equal rights to all its citizens. But in a way, it's respecting the national aspiration of the Palestinians as a people, those I'm talking now about left wing in Israel and maybe in the states that are thinking about uh, giving an answer to the national aspiration of the Palestinians, Israel as uh, an answer in uh, uh, Israel. I mean, the Jewish people as an answer <coughs> in Israel. So now what is left is 
to give Palestinians the answer. But as I said before, originally I come, I'm not, you know, in some of my discussion with <coughs> extreme right wing Israel, you have also right wing in Israel saying, well, we can live with the Palestinians, they are coming to visit us, we are visiting them, we can live together. So my answers to them, you, know, you can love them. I don't want to live with them because for me, it's more important to keep Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. So in a way, I'm being blamed for thinking about the Palestinians while I'm thinking about Israel as a Jewish state. And some of the settlers are trying to convince me that they can leave their settlement with the, the next Palestinian village. You cannot portray these as camps. It's, it's individual. Uh, basically, what, uh, the way you define right and left, it, it, it's not only in Israel, is that left wing basically is more, have more, uh, um, is, is, it, it, right wing feels that the other is, is afraid of the other. It's the enemy. And left wing feel uh, empathy to the other. And therefore, it, you can find left wing thinking about the Palestinians and how to help them, and therefore to give them a stay. And you can find uh, those thinking about, from a national perspective, about the state of Israel. You cannot portray it, it's, 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 it's a mix. It's a mix, what I'm trying to say in Israel, since in Israel, uh, the majority who supports the idea of two nation states are those supporting uh, the Israeli idea of Zionism based on a Jewish state. So this is the best way I was asked before how to convince the people is not by speaking about the Palestinians, it's by speaking about us, what we need, and in the way it is a just solution. What I say, is, it's not a favor to the Palestinians, it's not a favor to the Arabs, and when somebody supports the idea of two states for two people, it's not being pro-Palestinian and anti-Israeli. And an American president who supports the idea of two states for two peoples is not anti-Israeli, it's pro-peace, and it is an Israeli interest as well, and it's a, not everything in life is a zero-sum game. This issue both sides can enjoy. You know, one of the things I, <clears throat> I tell my students, what makes this conflict so difficult to resolve is that you, you have two national movements competing for the same space and you're trying to reconcile two rights. Not a right and a wrong, two rights. Two states for two peoples takes account of the fact that there are two national identities. When you look at the Middle East, wherever you find a state where there's more than one identity, whether it's tribal, sectarian, exactly or national, it's not at peace. So when you hear people say, one state's okay, what they're telling you is an enduring conflict is okay because that's what their prescription exactly, is. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Okay, Syria, so we have Lebanon, time for- Bosnia. Right. We have time for one more, I think, is that right? I'll use it. Okay, one more. <laughs> one more. A former student of mine. Yes, it's good to see you, Ambassador. So he knows all the answers. Yeah. <laughs> I wish. Let me just say that it's a privilege to have you here and listen to you. Um, I think for many of us who grew up in the diaspora, myself included, um, and who share your vision of Zionism as a liberal and democratic Jewish state, the status quo and the future certainly are concerning. Um, and I want to ask you about somewhat related topic to the conflict, but not directly related, and that is Israeli diaspora relations. Um, I guess the question is, do you worry about Israeli diaspora relations? and? If you were you know, to become prime minister, what would you do about it in the future? Um, you know, a lot of us, do you worry that in the diaspora we will one day see Israel not as our homeland, but just another state that yes, perhaps we share some interests in, but not you know, our future and our, our okay. life? The first thing that I would do is to say to the world jury, let's put aside the old dialogue, the old agreement, the idea that we are there for you as a safe shelter in, terms of, in case of anti-Semitism and you would contribute with money and donation, this was where the old days. Being the nation state of the Jewish people means that we need to share a basic understanding what does it mean to be a Jewish state. And the Jewish state is not a religious state. 
and therefore the monopoly of the Judaism or the Jewishness of the state is not uh, in the hands of the ultra-Orthodox parties in uh, Israel politics. And therefore we should respect different streams in Judaism because we need to understand that while the grandparents cried with joy when the State of Israel was established and their children were horrified that Yom Kippur war, the grandchildren sometimes feel alienated to Israel. It's not the same situation anymore. And being nation state of the Jewish people means also some responsibility to those that are not living now in Israel. And this is a completely different dialogue. And it's not going to be easy to do so politically in Israel. But I think that it's time to do it, to give you respect and, and a space, not just a space literally to, not just a space to express your faith in different ways, but also a space in the Western world to pray. And this is part of a completely different understanding. And it took me some time to understand it, by the way. I learned this just when I was Minister of Immigrant Absorption, and I, I, I uh, understood that uh, how difficult it is to, to young people here that we ex expect you to defend Israel when you have uh, in the campus uh, those that are speaking against, and you need to, to, to speak up. And then you come to Israel, and you feel, well, it's a different place. So therefore, a new dialogue based on an understanding that we are one family, one people. You can criticize sometimes uh, a policy, and we can sometimes have different opinions on different issues. But we need to have a basic understanding. What is the nature of Israel? What does it mean to be a Jewish state? And it is also a matter of values that we all share. You know, that's a wonderful way to wrap up. Here you're meeting in, a, in the Center for Jewish Civilization which says a lot in its title about the Jewish people, the values that uh, the Jewish, historically Jewish values have meant, yeah. human values. And you just described what the relationship should be between Israel as a nation state of the Jewish people and the diaspora as we collectively try to advance a Jewish civilization. Uh, first, I want to give you a gift from the Israel Alliance um, you know, this is Georgetown Hoyas, and now you will become an honorary Hoya. <laughs> Forever you will be welcome. You do have to wear the shirt, but... <laughs> ah! Thank you! Great. Next time I'm out there, I'm going to expect to see you wearing it, so it's... <laughs> I'm going uh -huh. to surprise you. <laughs> okay. Uh, by the way, I can live here with those. I know. This it's is an unbelievable yeah. setting. Okay. Thank you. But I also want to just, uh -huh. on behalf of everybody here, I want to thank you for, for coming. And more importantly, I want to thank you for the straightforwardness in which you answer the questions. I mean, this is an audience that I think may not always get people who come and sort of explain clearly why they believe what they believe. And part of your explanation for what the future requires in Israel is that your camp needs to lay out its vision, and clearly yeah. you've made that clear today. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.